Raj and to Sam for inviting me here. Uh, I do appreciate it. I think that the Cornell Political Union is really the best that Cornell has to offer. You invert, invite uh, intellectually diverse speakers and you engage in debate. And that's really, I think, one of the highest goals of Cornell University. So you applauded me. I applaud you for participating in this group. The resolution tonight is stop discriminating on the basis of race. How can I lose? <laughs> well, I'm going to try. <laughs> uh, it seems so self-evident, but there's a lot of issues wrapped up in that, mostly because of the debate over affirmative action. Um, and I'm not arguing for or against it tonight, but I am giving you my perspective on why I think it is extremely important as a society that we treat people as individuals, not as mere proxies for groups based on skin color or ethnicity. Uh, Chief Justice Roberts gave the full sentence from which our resolution is taken in the Parents Involved case, which involved uh, whether affirmative action as was permitted on a limited basis in higher education would apply to public high schools in Seattle and the court ruled that it did not, that you could not discriminate on the basis of race. And he wrote the plurality decision. So there was no single majority decision, but it was a 5-4 ruling overturning that practice. And he wrote, the way to stop discrimination on the basis of race is to stop discriminating on the basis of race. Seems a little self-evident to me, but there are a lot of people who find that offensive, who disagree with that that says, who uh, take the position that we do need to continue to discriminate on the basis of race in order to solve past historical wrongs. A um, Couple of preliminary points about the nature of the discussion that I'll be having and perhaps the debate we'll be having. First off is I use the term race in quotation marks, but that's a highly contentious term. It's a term we use all the time. It, uh, permeates this university discussion about race, but what does it really mean? Maybe a better view is perceived race or something else. Some academics will tell us that race is just a social construct, that there is actually no such thing as race. We're all part of one, the human race. Um, nonetheless, we classify people, and we've been doing it for many decades. There's actually a book which I recommend to you by professor, law professor David Bernstein, from uh, George Mason Law School called Classified. And he talks about the mess that we have created over many decades from racial and other classifications, how inconsistent it is, and how really irrational it is. And the same, I think, takes place here at Cornell and on most campuses. We throw around terms that we can't really define, and then we use those terms as a basis for judging people. Um, so. The census, the US census, has the same problem. Um, they talk about classifications of people, and they identify certain people that they identify by race. White, black, African American, American Indian or Alaska Native, Asian, and Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander. But they also have other classifications that have to do more with ethnicity. Um, particularly Hispanic. Uh, so you can be Hispanic, according to the US Census, and also one of these other races. Um, so it gets very confusing. Um, they also have a definition of white, which is not really intuitive to me. Um, I would have thought that meant somebody of European, perhaps even North European background. But according to the United States Census, the way they measure it, white is a person having origins in any of the original peoples of Europe, the Middle East, or North Africa. So what we throw around on this campus and what Cornell throws around um, in terms of racial classifications may not be obvious. I would not personally, without looking into this, have thought that someone from the Middle East would be classified by the US Census as white. Just another way in which these classifications that we use are in many ways very both irrational and counterintuitive. Um, in this university, we throw around those terms, and at most universities, the term white, the term non-white, um, the term people of color, and the time, 
term BIPOC, but none of those are really clearly defined. They're just terms that get used, really attributing, trying to classify people, mostly based on skin color and to some extent ancestry into a particular group, which is then used for a variety of purposes. And Cornell, before I came here today, I looked at Cornell's statistics. And those statistics are actually pretty irrational also. They have statistics on, um, I think they use the term uh, people of color or students of color. Well, what does that really mean? Um, it's all of this, these classifications that we use um, really are ill-defined. And in fact, the statistics on Cornell's website for the student population seem very inconsistent because it depends how you count people. Um, yet, it's something we talk about all the time in our politics, and it's something we talk about all the time on this campus. Which brings to me to one of the first points I want to make. How about we stop obsessed, obsessing over something so vaguely and inconsistently defined, like race? How about we focus on the individual as an individual, not as part of a classification? Second point is that what I'm talking about tonight is not strictly about what we would loosely call affirmative action. There are a lot of other issues, a lot of other legal issues, a lot of other issues wrapped up in that. Um, so I am not here tonight to argue the Harvard and UNC cases, which the Supreme Court is going to hear argument on next Monday, uh, big day. Uh, uh, affirmative action includes many factors, uh, including past racial disparities, and the argument by schools, including Cornell in an amicus brief, a friend of the court brief that it signed on to with about over a dozen other schools, that um, supports the use of race, racial preferences in admission, uh, be for the goal, the educational goal, of a diverse um, student body. And the Supreme Court will have to grapple with that. Um, but essentially what the schools are arguing is that the damage that we all know comes to society from racial discrimination, at least in one context, is worth a price to pay in order to achieve an educational goal. So what I want to do tonight is not really talk so much about affirmative action, but talk about the core issue, which I think will help inform a discussion of affirmative action, which is who are we as a society? As a society, we are actually systemically against racial discrimination. I know that's not a popular conception on campus. All we ever hear about is systemic racism. But I'll repeat it because you've probably never heard it on this campus uttered publicly. As a society, we are systemically against racial discrimination. How is that so? Well, first of all, through the Constitution, through the 14th Amendment, which says no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor, to deny, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. And so that's what you'll hear about, equal protection, and that's one of the issues at the Supreme Court. So right in our Constitution, at least as of 1868, there was the presumption that every person in this country is entitled to equal protection of the laws. Um, federal laws, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, also provides, it has many different provisions, but the provisions um, prohibit, uh, among other things, un it make it an unlawful employment practice for an employer uh, to engage in certain discriminatory acts based on a variety of factors, one of which is race and national origin. So as a matter of federal law, so as a matter of the Constitution, equal protection is a matter of federal law, we um, prohibit discrimination on the basis of, late, of race. There are also state laws. New York State has New York human rights law, which prohibits the same conduct. There are a variety of federal and state regulations which prohibit discrimination on the basis of race. And there are even campus rules that prohibit discrimination on the basis of race, including Cornell Policy 6.4, which addresses a 
variety of things, and mostly you probably hear about it in terms of campus due process and the procedures that are used. But as a substantive matter, Cornell Policy 6.4 um, provides that the university does not discriminate on the basis of protected status, and among the statuses that it does not discriminate on are race, ethnic, or national origin. So at every level of our society, we have embedded into the law non-discrimination on the basis of race. Um, you could certainly argue we haven't lived up to it. That's a different question. That's just a matter of enforcing and better practicing what is what our system provides. But as we have accepted as a society and at Cornell University that discrimination on the basis of race is wrong. So why do universities do it anyway? Um, and so the question that I have is, are we willing to compromise or sacrifice a core value, which I presume everybody in this room and everybody, or 99.9% .9 of the people accept that we should not discriminate on the basis of race. So why are we willing to compromise or sacrifice that core value for some other perceived good? And is that good for society or bad for society? Um, so the issue is not just being, to me, kind of third point, the issue is not just being against racial discrimination, but it's also how we measure it. And I think we have a tendency on this campus and elsewhere throughout higher education and, and really in many aspects of society to focus on groups, to say that what the measure of justice is do groups have equal outcomes as opposed to are every, is every individual treated fairly without regard to race. That's certainly the philosophy at Cornell. Um, there is an entire DEI set of rules and bureaucracy that is devoted to measuring group outcomes and to achieving as close to equal group outcomes. Um, that's the philosophy at just about every campus. But I would argue that to the extent to achieve those outcomes, we need to violate our core value of not discriminating on the basis of race. We are giving up something very fundamental to the campus and fundamental to our society and fundamental to the way we view people for a result which can be fleeting. Results among groups change over time. Um, if you look at, it's not the racial aspect, but if you look at gender, uh, you look at um, women in the sciences and you look at women elsewhere, in just a couple of decades, those numbers have shifted dramatically. I remember seeing a statistic just recently that the percentage of people seeking, I think it was PhDs in psychology, is now something like nine, eight or nine to one in favor of women. That doesn't make it wrong. Um, that doesn't make it sexist. Um, but if you'd gone back 20 years ago, it would have looked very differently. And so my point is, these group statistics, how groups perform over time, can vary dramatically. And that we should not be giving up a core value of our society, kind of a guiding light of our society, which is you do not judge people based on their perceived race in order for what could be transitory group results. Um, so I like to focus on the individual, and that's my argument. When we move um, to viewing individuals merely as group members and to classifying and, and treating them based on race, we are vi violating our core value. And we're inevitably violating it. You can't help but violate it because most things in society are zero-sum games. There are finite resources. People compete for admission spots. There are only a certain number of admission spots. People complete, compete for jobs. There's only a certain number of job spots at a particular company. Um, and when you make those decisions based upon race, then you are depriving somebody else. It's not just that you're favoring somebody based on their race, but in a zero-sum game where there's a limited number of spots, you are depriving somebody else of that based on their race. And again, I'm using race in a very broad term here. Um, so discrimination in favor of some people is still discrimination, and it's something that violates our core value. Uh, discrimination in favor of one group necessarily, in a zero-sum world, is discrimination against another group. 
the Cornell amicus brief in the Harvard case um, that I've been reading, uh, one of the things I read in preparation for today, is that they say they have no choice but to use race as one of the factors in deciding admission. <coughs> that they could not achieve the group outcomes that they want which is essentially their diversity percentages that they want without engaging or using race as a factor. And that is essentially uh, Ibram Kendi's formulation, his anti-racism formulation. His most famous line is, current discrimination is okay, not just okay, but good in order to remedy past discrimination. And future discrimination is good to remedy current discrimination. The problem with that is that it's a societal dead end. It pits people against each other. It views them as groups. It pits groups against groups. Um, we've seen that in the past, and Harvard paved the way. Uh, Harvard is now in the Supreme Court, and they're talking about the holistic model. That's how they try to evade prior Supreme Court precedent. They say they only use race as one part of a holistic model. Well, the holistic model was not invented by Harvard for um, what we would call race now, it was not for um, skin color diversity. Uh, it was invented in the 1920s to restrict the percentage of Jews at Harvard. It's well documented, I don't think anybody disputes that. That based on the grades, I don't think they had the SATs back then, but based on those other factors, Jews were a starkly rising percentage of the Harvard College student body, and Harvard didn't want that. So they dropped those measurements, those more uh, statistical and objective measurements, and created the holistic model. And if you look at the chart, you see the percentage of Jews at Harvard in the 1920s, they come in with the holistic model, it drops down, and it's been more or less even throughout time. You see the exact same chart, you can lay one on top of the other, but fast forward 70 years with Asian admission, people of Asian descent admission to Harvard. You see the number coming up, and then you see it going down, and then you see it being held steady. Because the holistic model is just a ruse. The holistic model is a ruse for the equivalent of quotas, uh, but it allows them to hide behind it. And look how damaging that is to our society. The, uh, most people, the people most commonly now fighting against that sort of system are not people of North European descent. They are people of Asian descent um, who are being treated unfairly. You can measure that in statistics by this holistic model. So look how damaging that is to our society where you have people being deprived of something because of their race, again, using that in a broad term, which would include uh, national origin, um, uh, in order to achieve some other goal. Um, so, this is a dead end. This pits students against each other. This pits groups against each other. This um, creates animosity. This creates bitterness. I would suggest, um, or it has been suggested by Dorian Abbott, a professor at the University of uh, Chicago, some sort of physicist, astrophysicist, I think he is. Um, and he had a big controversy because he was boycotted when he gave a lecture at MIT. And he, he proposes that we use a merit, fairness, and equality st standard instead of DEI, uh, MFE, um, which is uh, expand the pool of people. It is not discriminatory to make sure you are reaching out to people, to bring them into the pool, to bring them into the system, to maybe offer them help, not based on the color of their skin, but their need for help, to examine the systems we use, and he was talking about faculty hiring, but examine the systems we use to make sure there's no bias built into it, that people are not discriminated against on the basis of race. One of the things he advocates getting rid of is, um, you know, alumni prefer preferences, legacy preferences, because that I think statistically probably does favor whites, whites with quotation marks, because of the history of past uh, discrimination. Uh, so he says, get rid of all these things, widen the pool, invite people in, give them help, make sure it's a fair process. But at the end of the day, in this finite world of job openings, particularly in academia, you cannot make race the decision between two people. You have to find other factors. For that, he was boycotted. Um, 
So where I'd like to wrap up is to focus you on some personal anecdotes that um, show me how damaging this system of racial classification, how damaging promoting people or not promoting them on the basis of race um, has become and how we need to do better. Um, so one of the things I did in preparing for today is I listened to an oral argument in the Second Circuit Court of Appeals, the Federal Second Circuit, Circuit Court of Appeals, this morning. And it's a really interesting case. The title of the case is William Jacobson versus uh, Mary Barrett, uh, New York State Health Commissioner. That would be me. So I'm the plaintiff in a case, uh, not arguing it, we have lawyers to do that, involving racially discriminatory COVID therapeutic guidelines issued by the state of New York that when the therapeutics were in short supply, um, New York State issued guidelines in order to qualify for the limited supply, zero sum game, can't give them to everybody. Therapeutics, you have to prove certain things. You have to prove you have COVID, so you need a positive test. You have to prove that you've presented yourself for treatment within five days because the therapeutics were only, are only good for five, within the first five days. You can't have severe, uh, you can't be hospitalized, you can't have severe symptoms. Um, you have to be 12 years old and 100 pounds. Um, and then you need to show a risk factor. And under those guidelines, merely being non-white, and that's the term they use, non-white, is a risk factor, you qualify. If you are white, you have to show something personally health-wise wrong with you. You have a heart condition, you have diabetes, whatever. In what world is it okay to have medical decisions based upon, or rationing of medications based upon race? If somebody comes into the room, you examine them as a physician, and one person is more sick than the other. But this presumes that because the African American community has higher rates of diabetes, that they are therefore more at risk from COVID. That might be true as a group, but you're treating a patient. And not every African American has diabetes. Test the person. Not every white person doesn't have diabetes. Test the person. So that is a good example of how this focus on racial classification, this assumption of group outcomes, has really poisoned so much of it. Another one which I think highlights the absurdity of our current system, where I house I used to live at in Rhode Island, next door neighbor, uh, two physicians. Um, one of them was from Colombia, and one of them was from the United States. Uh, the Colombian woman was obviously of Spanish ancestry, not native South American ancestry, because she looked European. Um, they had an Anglo last name. They, um, their kids, even though we were in the best school district in the state, went to an extremely expensive private school. I lived next door to them for two decades, never once heard them speak Spanish at home. I don't think the kids spoke Spanish. There is no way either of these kids ever were discriminated on the basis of their mother's Hispanic origin. Yet one day, a card was misdirected to our mailbox instead of theirs. And the son was being solicited and invited to a multicultural day at Yale University. So he obviously had checked the box as his box is Hispanic, and as part of their affirmative action program, they were reaching out to him to bring him in. In what world is that fair? That's not. Uh, rather than examine whether someone themselves or their family has suffered because of discrimination, they just assign a classification to somebody and then use that as a basis for admissions. Somebody who did not do that is my wife. My wife's ancestry is from the Jews who were expelled by, from Spain in the Spanish Inquisition. Her father, or her grandfather, I should say, grew up on the Isle of Rhodes, which had in one of the ancient Jewish communities that were expelled from Spain. They spoke Ladino, you can look it up, Ladino at home. Um, my father-in-law, may he rest in peace, grew up speaking Ladino at home. It never dawned on my wife to check the box. She could have probably checked Hispanic ancestry. How absurd would that have been? How unfair would that have been? Um, so she didn't do it. Um, so what I'm saying is the um, classifications, the use of race, this, these indefinite terms ends up not being an argument over what's right, 
It ends up being an argument over power. And it ends up pitting people against each other. And we shouldn't have it in the university. The university has dedicated itself and sworn in Rule 6.4 they will not do that. Yet in their brief to Har in the Harvard case, they say they do it. They say they use race as a determining factor. And without it, they say, they could not achieve the end result that they want. I do think that John Roberts had it right. Maybe these practices were justified 50, 60 years ago, but they're not justified now. He had it right. At a certain point in time, we have to accept that the way to stop discrimination on the basis of race is to stop discriminating on the basis of race.